Okay, thank you very much. For uh, We're going to switch gears from one uh, substance to a different set of substances. Uh, my name is Kenneth Tupper. I'm a Director of Implementation and Partnerships with the British Columbia Centre on Substance Use. Uh, before I begin, I just want to acknowledge that we're on the traditional Indigenous territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples. I understand there's a, a range of First Nations peoples that occupied this land. I want to give that acknowledgement because I'm going to be speaking about a class of substances that have long been known about in traditional indigenous knowledge practices in the Americas, uh, North, Central and South America. And so, just give me a... Yeah, so uh, there's a range of different types of visionary plants that have been used for ceremonial, uh, spiritual and healing purposes, including what we were just talking about, cannabis, of course, as well as a variety of other plants. The, the class of substances that I'm going to focus on today are over on the, the right-hand side of your, the screen. So psilocybin, which comes from psilocybin mushrooms, uh, ayahuasca, which contains a substance called dimethyltryptamine, which is an analog of psilocybin, uh, and morning glory traditionally uh, is a, is a uh, seed that contains lysergic acid amide, which is an analog of LSD. Uh, and so those, are, those substances all fit in the general class of what are, are known as uh, psychedelic compounds or hallucinogens in the medical terminology. As I mentioned, they've been used for uh, since time immemorial. This uh, is a nice graphic representation of the early hominid practices of using plants for visionary purposes. Uh, it's been hypothesized that some of our earliest religious impulses may have come from the use of psychoactive plants in our environment. Uh, this is a representation of what's known as the stoned ape hypothesis that uh, sort of creative inspiration for in things including language may have come from our experiences with psychoactive mushrooms or plants. Uh, no archaeological evidence to confirm this uh, or uh, deny it, but it's an uh, interesting hypothesis. Certainly, uh, we know that animals seek out plants in their environment uh, to use for altering consciousness, and humans around the world uh, have done the same. So, although these substances were used uh, traditionally, it was the discovery of their psychoactive components in the late 19th and early 20th century that led to a revolution in pharmacology uh, after World War II, particularly the discovery of the drug LSD by the Swiss company Sandoz. Uh, it was uh, w one of a, a sort of class of, of drugs that were experimented with in the 1950s uh, by pharmaceutical uh, companies and, and psychiatrists and medical community who were interested in the psychiatric uh, p potentials of these drugs. Uh, there was very little understood about uh, neurology, neurobiology in the brain at the time. Uh, the discovery of LSD was actually coincidental with the discovery of serotonin uh, as a neurotransmitter in the brain and led to a, a whole sort of class of, of research into the uh, sort of neurobiology of, of drugs generally and the psycho what's known as the psychopharmacology revolution. There was a number of uh, both methodological and regulatory challenges in, in doing research with these drugs, including the uh, sort of standardized uh, um, research methodology of a randomized control trial where giving somebody uh, an experimental medication and a placebo, or dividing groups of people into receiving experimental medications and placebos, uh, didn't work as well with psychedelic drugs in that it became very apparent uh, after an hour or so who was receiving the placebo and who was receiving the experimental medication, both to the subjects themselves and to the clinicians who were administering it. Uh, so there was actually concerted efforts by some of the research groups at the time to say we don't need to worry about randomized control trials, we just need to harness the, what's known as set and setting, the psychological preparation and the environment in which these substances are used to maximize their therapeutic uh, effects. That, of course, uh, didn't fly so well with the broader scientific community, but part and parcel of and, and some of the research that happened at the time was showing considerable therapeutic efficacy, particularly here in Canada. We were a world leader uh, in this area. The word psychedelic was actually coined in Weyburn, Saskatchewan by a psychiatrist who was working at the Weyburn Mental Hospital. Uh, some of the most innovative research was uh, using LSD to treat alcoholism. And again, there was considerable therapeutic efficacy that was demonstrated, uh, but the research was mostly terminated by the end of the 1970s when young people in the 1960s uh, began to experiment with these drugs outside of clinical settings uh, and with a much more sort of hedonistic uh, or, or, uh, bent to what they were doing. So it was the 
sort of combination of some of the regulatory and, and methodological challenges, as well as the much broader non-medical use that led governments around the world to add this class of substances to the 1971 Convention on Psychotropic Substances, which is one of the key uh, backbones of the international drug control system. These drugs were put into Schedule I, which means by definition they have no medical value, highly likely to be abused, uh, and basically just shouldn't be touched, and extremely difficult to get even for research purposes. So the effect of this classification uh, did very little to keep them off the streets, uh, did a lot to keep them out of the hands of scientists and doctors. So about for the next 40 years approximately, uh, there was no human subject re research done anywhere in the world. Uh, it started very slowly again in the 1990s. But what we've seen in the last uh, decade has been a renaissance in what's known as psychedelic medicine uh, and greater sort of interest and acceptability in the medical community that these substances may have medical potential and that scientific research should at least be conducted to determine what's, what's the, the possibility here. This is a, an article that was published in the Canadian Medical Association Journal in 2015 uh, that summarizes some of the recent, recent uh, research evidence in this area. So the fact that the CMAJ put this on their cover uh, illustrates a greater sort of acceptable, sort of at least for discussion purposes, uh, sort of willingness to look at these substances in the, the medical community. So some of the research that's going on, uh, I'm not going to summarize all of the different studies uh, that, that are happening or the results that have been reported, but just to sort of to highlight very uh, at a high level, uh, psilocybin, as I mentioned in, in the psychoactive component of magic mushrooms, is being looked at for treatment of depression, for end-of-life anxiety, uh, and for addictions. Uh, the traditional Amazonian brew ayahuasca is being looked at for depression, addiction, eating disorders. MDMA, which is known on the street as ecstasy, uh, is being studied for post-traumatic stress disorder. And LSD has been looked at for end-of-life end anxiety and for addiction. So all of these substances, as I say, are in the same general pharmacological class, and it seems that they may be applicable for a whole host of indications, uh, conditions for which modern Western pharmaceutical medicine doesn't seem to do a very good job of treating. The sort of standard treatments for a lot of these uh, conditions uh, are of somewhat limited efficacy for some people some of the time. SSRI, SSRI antidepressants, for example, uh, have been shown to have sort of not that much better effect than placebo over time. Uh, whereas the research that's being done into psychedelics is showing off the charts uh, potential success rates that are really sort of uh, blowing psychiatry researchers out of the water with respect to the possibilities that, that are being done. So the, I, I'm just, again, not going to get into the details, but what we're seeing right now is uh, sort of phase two clinical research, which means sort of small treatment populations uh, selected for uh, sort of inclusion criteria that's uh, relatively narrow, so uh, they're not quite ready for prime time. But the clinicians today are following rigorous methodological and ethical procedures and protocols. Again, something that wasn't always done in the 1960s, as infamously the CIA was funding LSD research in the 1960s that went very much awry. There's still legal cases outstanding with respect to people suffering from essentially mind control research where they were administered these drugs without consent uh, and without any ethical protocols. So the research that's being done now is uh, conforming the highest ethical standards with uh, university research uh, ethics boards approving of them. There are precise doses of pharmaceutical grade medications being administered. I would say with the exception of ayahuasca, which is being studied in a sort of traditional in indigenous style brew form. The emphasis is on psychedelic assisted psychotherapy in terms of it's not just the drug, take two, call us in the morning. Uh, it's very much about uh, preparation, uh, having a, a patient working with a therapist team in advance of taking the medication and then being supervised throughout the experience when they have the medication uh, and then integration therapy without any drugs after they have the medication. Uh, the treatments usually only evolve a few drug facilitated sessions, typically one, two or three sessions, spaced several weeks apart uh, with, the, as I say, non-drug preparatory and integration before and afterwards. So the whole co course of treatments generally lasts four, four months, five months, uh, with, uh, say, only three drug sessions happening in that time period. Now, these substances are not panaceas. They're, uh, they're, they're, say, there seem to be uh, extremely uh, exciting efficacy results being reported, but there are risks as well. In terms of the physical risks, uh, the, the acute toxicity of these substances is ex extremely low. When LSD was discovered, it was actually one of the least toxic substances uh, that had a pharmacolo pharmacological activity that had ever been discovered, and that's still the case today. 
So they are, are very benign with respect to their impacts on the body. And in terms of chronic toxicity, toxicity uh, limited or none, it doesn't see, there's no sort of evidence that people get significantly harmed in terms of toxicity over time from using these things. In terms of addiction, uh, people do not report chronic dependent patterns of use with the class of drugs known as psychedelics. I had a friend who ran an addiction treatment center in Vancouver for 25 years, and he said never once did somebody come in saying, help, I can't stop taking magic mushrooms. Uh, he said, you know, sometimes they, if they mentioned psychedelics, they were usually sort of fifth or sixth or seventh on a list of different substances, which usually started with like alcohol, tobacco, cocaine, et cetera, et cetera. And then maybe, you know, with poly substance use, they'd have psychedelics in the mix. Uh, but psychedelics in and of themselves do not lend them, do not lend themselves to chronic dependent patterns of use. And, and as I've pointed out, actually tend to have the exact opposite effect in terms of leading people to stop chronic dependent patterns of use of other types of substances. There is something in the psychiatric literature known as hallucinogen persisting perception disorder, HPPD, uh, more colloquially known as flashbacks. Uh, those have been reported. They're extremely rare, however, in terms of epidemiology, and that's only uh, with the non-medical use of illicit substances procured on the street. There hasn't been any of this reported in the current contemporary scientific investigation that's been happening. So uh, still more research to be done on that, but it seems to be very rare and, and not something to be too concerned about in terms of clinical application at the moment. Psychosis, uh, for people who have an underlying predisposition to something like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, uh, there may be uh, significant reasons not to engage in, in the use of these kinds of medications. So they're not necessarily for everybody, and further research is going to help us to elucidate who uh, may be effective candidates for treatment and who not. But currently, these uh, people in this class, uh, people with risks uh, for underlying psychosis, uh, are typically excluded from the research. And then in terms of behavioral risks, uh, certainly there's, you know, uh, stories of people who've had high doses of psychedelics and been in very dangerous situations on top of a building uh, or on the street uh, in traffic where unfortunate tragic consequences have arisen. Uh, so certainly supervision is, is uh, sort of paramount in the use of these things, which is why people who are given these drugs in the clinical research are supervised throughout the entire session and they aren't allowed to wander off anywhere. So the excitement on this, uh, the, the FDA uh, re reviewed the phase two clinical trial results for MDMA-assisted therapy and has declared it a breakthrough therapy. It's essentially better than anything else that's currently available uh, for treatment of uh, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, which means this is now being fast-tracked for phase three clinical trials. Uh, they've also more recently uh, declared psilocybin a breakthrough therapy for depression, looking at some of the clinical results for that. So again, these, this class of substances is being taken very seriously by regulatory authorities in the United States states of all places, uh, but also in, in the European Medicine Agency, here in Canada by Health Canada. Uh, everybody seems to be paying attention now. And the fact that I'm invited here to speak at this conference, I think, is testament to the, to the uh, possibilities that these substances may have as disruptive technologies. So in terms of planned clinical research, uh, there's a whole host of universities, mostly Ivy League schools in the US, are now either are putting in place or have plans to put in place psychedelic research labs. The phase three clinical trial that I mentioned with respect to MDMA-assisted treatment of PTSD is up and running. They're recruiting subjects in many of the sites in the United States. Here in Canada, there will be two sites, one in Vancouver and one in Montreal. Uh, and the site in Vancouver is hosted by the British Columbia Center on Substance Use, where I work. There are also two phase three clinical trials being planned to look at safety and efficacy of psilocybin treatment for depression, one in the UK and Europe, and one in the United States. Uh, and at the BCCSU, we're also putting together clinical protocols for investigator-initiated trials on looking at psilocybin-assisted treatment for substance use disorders. Uh, obviously, with the current opioid overdose crisis affecting North America, uh, there's significant interest in new innovative types of treatments for addictions, uh, and there's the possibility that psychedelics may help play a role in, in addressing this issue. Some of the other research that's fascinating, in addition to the clinical research where scientists are administering these drugs in clinical settings, are uh, studies on healthy human subjects and large-scale population studies where uh, basically they ask literally hundreds of thousands of people questions about their drugs, the drug use patterns and behaviors, uh, and they've long collected data on people, uh, people's drug use uh, but have until recently not analyzed psychedelic specific questions. Uh, and when this has been done recently, what they find is that, uh, again, in healthy human subjects and among general population, it seems to reduce addiction, suicidality, criminality, uh, and recidivism, or the likelihood of returning to prison after having been in prison. 
Uh, so all of these things are decreased. And then in terms of increases, uh, the personality trait of openness, becoming more open-minded, optimism, uh, nature-relatedness, a sort of ecological orientation, spirituality and divergent thinking are all reported to be increased uh, by people who have uh, the effects of, of these substances in optimal conditions. Again, I have to emphasize the importance of set and setting, uh, that treating these substances uh, respectfully and intentionally uh, as powerful cognitive tools is, is crucial. In terms of uh, the non-medical potential, this has actually been my own area of research interest uh, since 1999, where I did my master's thesis on the educational potential of psychedelics, and then went on to do my PhD uh, on the globalization of ayahuasca and the public policy implications of, it, of its uh, uptake outside the Amazon, uh, but also to look at the potential non-medical or cognitive enhancement uh, benefits. So it seems that these substances are, have the unique capacity to induce experiences of wonder and awe, which contemporary Western uh, societies, or maybe even global societies, seem to be somewhat alienated from that, uh, you know, kids, I, I joke that kids start kindergarten age five or six full of curiosity and wonder about the world and the universe around them. And if they retain any of that by age 17 or 18, when they finished high school, it's usually despite their schooling, not because of it. And so it seems that a catalyst in the sort of a rite of passage, the age between like 17 and 25 years old, is a time when young people uh, may very much benefit from the type of meaning and purpose that these types of experiences can, can catalyze. Not to say that psychedelic drugs are the only way to achieve these. There are many other types of, of practices that can, can help to precipitate these types of experiences, but psychedelics are certainly uh, a fascinating class of, of drugs and plants that uh, have been used for literally thousands of years for exactly these kinds of purposes in traditional indigenous practices. So, and, and there were claims of, of, of course, creativity and imagination. Uh, I was a Beatles fan, and I knew that the Beatles uh, in the early 1960s and the music they created was quite different from the music they created in the later 1960s after they had experiences with psychedelics. Uh, so that was uh, sort of one of the interests that led me to, to, to this uh, line of, of inquiry. Uh, more recently, uh, some of you may be aware, Michael Pollan, a uh, best-selling author on food and food systems, uh, became interested in psychedelics. This book was published in May of 2018 uh, on the New York, New York Times bestseller list. Uh, highly recommend, essentially, he's uh, looked at the latest science, interviewed a number of the key researchers, uh, as well as patients, as well as he himself uh, underwent experiences with these substances uh, and uh, puts together a nice um, user-friendly narrative of what the potential is and, and where we're going with respect to uh, psychedelic science. I throw this up. Uh, St Steve Jobs uh, was well known to have dabbled with psychedelic drugs and in, in his uh, biography uh, said that taking LSD was a profound experience, one of the most important things in his life. He said he show LSD shows you that there's another side to the coin. So there's a sort of history in the technology uh, sector, actually, that long predates Steve Jobs and the found founding of Apple. Um, I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. But in terms of explanatory mechanisms, you know, one of the fascinating re research discoveries with uh, neuroscience and psychedelics is the effects that they're have, having on the brain and what's known as the default mode network, which is a, a set of brain regions that are connected together when uh, people are sort of not engaged in anything in particular, when you're sort of daydreaming or just sort of your brain is at rest. The default mode network is actually at heightened activity. Now what's fascinating is when you hear people's reports of their experiences under the influence of drugs like LSD or psilocybin, you would think that there's heightened brain activity, that there's increased blood flow. What they found is exactly the opposite, that the default mode network is actually suppressed with respect to activity and blood flow. And that this seems to allow for crosstalk between different parts of the brain that aren't ordinarily connected with one another. And this is a nice illustration from Neuroscience Lab at UK Imperial College London by Dr. Robert, Robin Carhart Harris, who was actually in Davos last week speaking uh, to the Davos crowd on this topic as well. Uh, basically showing that, that psilocybin has the, this effect of, of suppressing the default mode network activity and facilitating a crosstalk in the brain. Also, even more recent uh, research on the neurogenesis, synaptogenesis, and neuroplasticity effects of psychedelic drugs in vitro. Uh, so it seems that, that these substances may catalyze uh, neural, neural growth and, and synapto, synaptic uh, connections, essentially rewiring the brain which again can be either positive or negative depending on the intentionality, how it's being used, with what intention, uh, with what circumstances.
I, I'd be remiss not to mention the sort of trend of microdosing, which is uh, using small amounts, usually about one tenth of a standard uh, sort of street dose, uh, in a sort of regimen of taking these every couple of days uh, for weeks or months uh, or even longer, uh, where people are reporting significant heightened uh, sort of attention, creativity, focus. Unfortunately, there's no science to corroborate any of this currently. Uh, there's been, I think, only one or two publications on microdosing, and those are just sort of uh, surveys, no clinical research where people have actually received these drugs uh, in a sort of controlled setting. Uh, but there's certainly a lot of buzz and a lot of hype. Uh, there's speculation it may all just be, be placebo effect. People are uh, excited about the possibilities, so they you know, perceive that they're getting some kind of uh, cognitive enhancement effect. Whether that's the case, again, sci more science needs to be done in order to determine what the possibilities are for microdosing. Uh, I mentioned Steve Jobs. This is, uh, in terms of the sort of technology sector, a fascinating book by John Markoff, an investigative journalist who s did the research on two government programs funded by the US Department of Defense and the CIA in the early 1960s in the Bay Area of California. The Department of Defense was funding computer science research and the CIA was funding LSD mind control. Or what They were actually just looking at, at that point, just uh, basic uh, effects, of, psychological effects of LSD. What they were doing was drawing on graduate students in the universities to become uh, participants in the LSD studies, and it turned out that a significant number of the grad students that came out to take LSD were computer science grad students. So the, John Markoff makes this interesting connection between these two US government programs and, and jokes that there's no coincidence that Haight-Ashbury, the sort of ground, ground zero of the flower, flower power era of the 1960s, and Silicon Valley are just down the road from one another. That this, uh, and that the early computer science movement was actually very much catalyzed, in the Bay Area at least, uh, by experiences with psychic psychedelic drugs where young graduate students were having visions of the futures of computing when computers were huge mainframes that would take up the, you know, the size of this room uh, and had punch card inf interfaces. There was no sort of graphic displays yet. But the, the ideas of what computers might become in the future were being realized in advance of their, uh, their development. Now, with respect to the future of psychedelic science, some of the most interesting and exciting possibilities may be the uh, combination of different types of therapeutic interventions. I spoke at a conference in Vancouver last year, the Interface Health Summit, which is very interested in uh, sort of health technology and uh, virtual reality, for example. So maybe you know, virtual reality is being studied for uh, a variety of possible interventions in the mental health area. Uh, it might be that the psychedelics are disruptive technologies and VR might also be that the sum may be greater than the whole of the parts with respect to their co-application, that perhaps psychedelics and VR together, or something called transcranial magnetic stimulation, uh, which is a brain, both an imaging and a diag di imaging diagnostic and uh, intervention technique, uh, may also be applied uh, coincidental with the use of psychedelics. So there's a whole host of second, third generation questions uh, that need to be sort of researched uh, as we move forward with psychedelic science. But for now, uh, we're basically at the very beginning stage, uh, still conducting phase two clinical trials. I'm, I'm going to mention that the sort of horizon of possibility for policy reform is already emerging in the public health arena. Uh, the idea of um, the, the, the international drug control system has been very ineffective in its uh, aims of reducing uh, uh, illicit drug supply and illicit drug use, uh, and that the public health community is very much talking about post-prohibition models for regulation and control, as we've recently seen with cannabis, uh, so too likely with other drugs. And it may be that psychedelics are the next uh, substances that are going to be uh, reclassified with respect to their potential risks and benefits, uh, and it seems that the medical interventions, prob probably also ultimately the non-medical potential cognitive enhancement uh, uh, benefits, will be accommodated through policy changes uh, at the uh, certainly federal government level and, and perhaps international drug control level down the road. Uh, so for, I'm going to leave it there, uh, and thank you all for your attention. I'm happy to take, I think I've got a few minutes for questions if anybody has any. I, I want to make a plea for uh, research funding, however. Essentially, the, you know, the, the model of drug development uh, historically has been uh, developed by and for big pharma, uh, but there hasn't been any investment coming from that domain uh, for these types of substances. Uh, and they're uh, the sort of regulatory, uh, sorry, I should say that the health uh, 
granting agencies such as the U.S. National Institute on Health and the Canadian Institute on Health Research also haven't been uh, providing any money for this kind of research. Currently, almost all of the research that's happening is through private philanthropic donations, largely actually from the IT sector. Uh, so if any of you uh, is interested in supporting basic scientific research with the idea of this perhaps uh, becoming a disruptive technology in the future, I'd be happy to talk to you further. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. You're all just stunned. <laughs> uh, happy to take any questions, either at the mic or, or afterwards. Sorry, can, can, you, can you use the microphone? I, I can't quite hear you. Thanks so much. I was just wondering, rolling it back a bit with THC, is there anything with THC that might be a, a platform to propel this type of research and get more policy input into it? You know, because obviously we're, we're going to have recreational edibles coming up. There'll be big databases. We just had the panel. And I know it's not quite the same as, say, magic mushrooms, but, you know, there are some parallels. I think the parallels are more social than anything else. Certainly, they're very different pharmacologically. The cannabinoid system, the endocannabinoid system is quite different. These drugs, uh, psychedelics, all work on the serotonin uh, receptor system. So they have, I, I'd say, I think the similarities are more in the sort of social realm where people who are interested in cannabis were also interested in, in psilocybin mushrooms or psychedelics more generally. Um, I think there's lessons to be learned with respect to the policy, policy changes that we've seen over the last decade. First, with, with medical accommodations for compassionate use of cannabis. Uh, there's people who are talking about the same type of uh, accommodations for psychedelics, particularly in some of the most innovative researches on end-of-life care, palliative care. For people who have a terminal illness uh, and seeking better quality of life, uh, psychedelics have been shown to reduce anxiety and depression for people in the last 6 to 12 months of life where they reconnect with their families, they feel uh, sort of connected to a higher power. So there's a, a possibility that accommodations for um, human rights uh, access for these, these medications could open the door for more uh, safety and efficacy type of research, separate from the clinical trial research that I mentioned is, is happening. So it, yeah, I'm sure there's lots, lots of lessons to be learned in the cannabis, from the cannabis world in this area, uh, but I think pharmacologically they're quite distinct. Okay, well, I'll, I'll leave it here, and thank you very much for your attention.